Well, welcome to our February lunch bunch. I was a little concerned, Ruth, when you said you were bringing everybody in from the weight room with Marvon. I thought maybe he had, you know, some of us back there on the dumbbells again, and we had to go back to doing to doing weights. But uh, I, I guess that's something different. We certainly welcome all of you uh, coming together in spite of our, our virtual uh, platform, but uh, really enjoy having alumni and faculty, staff, students, and friends of the university joining us. So uh, welcome all. I'm Bill Zish, uh, class of 1979 mining, and I'm currently the president of the Mines Alumni Board. Uh, I know many of you have been to our lunch bunch before, so uh, welcome back. And for those of you that's the first time, we hope you, uh, you enjoy it. We're excited today to be able to showcase our newly formed scholarship communities program with special guest speakers, Dr. Colin Terry, Assistant Vice President for Student Life, and uh, Tony Lefton, Teaching Professor, Assistant Provost for the Signature Student Experience, and Executive Director of the University Honors and Scholars Program. I'm personally really looking forward to uh, today's event and uh, welcome uh, Colin and, T and Tony here. Before we get started, a few uh, housekeeping items. Um, some of you have submitted questions ahead of time and, and we've shared those with Colin and Tony. If you have a question that comes up during the program, just uh, I think, Ruth, we want to go through the chat and uh, raise the questions through chat and uh, we'll have an opportunity to address them at the end of the presentation. Um, we are recording the program and we record um, our monthly lunch bunches. So if there's other uh, meetings that you want to go back and listen to, uh, you can do that at the alumni website, weare.minds.edu. So uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Colin Terry to get us started. Colin. Thanks, Bill. And it's a pleasure to be here. Am I coming through nicely? Great. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. I know Tony and I are grateful for this opportunity and, and we're going to toggle back and forth. We have a few slides we want to go through. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself in a moment. Tony will have a chance to introduce herself. And, and uh, if at any point you have any questions, again, put them in the chat. We can definitely pause and, and try and answer those or, or get to them at the end. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And we've prepared a, a very loose presentation uh, to um, guide us through today's conversation. Um, and really, we're going to talk about scholar communities. We're also going to talk about some professional development stuff. We're going to talk about university honors and scholar efforts out of Tony's area. Broadly speaking, Tony and I are going to kind of talk about this signature student experience and the charge the two of us uh, mutually burdened together to, to try and achieve some exciting things for our, for our students. And to give a little, uh, well, before I do that, I, I should pause and do an introduction. Um, so as Bill said, I'm the Assistant Vice President for Student Life. I've been at Mines. this is my 12th year. Um, it's been a real honor to, to work at Mines, and I, and I hope to continue working at Mines for a long time. I uh, work in student life leadership and clearly work with scholar communities and professional development, which I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, I also oversee a few offices that are in complement to these efforts. Uh, so the Career Center, the Multicultural Engineering Program, Disability Support Services, and the Center for Academic Advising um, and Support all also report to me as well. And uh, recently I was uh, given the opportunity to teach at McBride with Tony, which was a great honor as well. So. What Tony and I are going to talk to you today um, is about the signature student experience. And in many ways, the next two slides, this and the one that follow, capture what it is we're trying to achieve. And um, maybe you've seen this slide. This comes from Dr. Johnson. This is uh, directly from some of his materials related to the Minds at 150 campaign and aspirational push. And what we're going to be talking to you about falls within the umbrella of complementing the uh, excellent technical experience and training that our students get in the classroom through an emphasis on some business, whether that's business acumen, leadership, professional development, and this idea of context and passion 
uh, thinking critically about societal needs, innovation, the humanities, policy. Um, really what Tony and I are going to share with you today align with those two complementing uh, uh, circles of passion, of, of context and passion in business. And you might hear us reference the signature student experience. There's a lot going on in this slide. Don't feel as though you need to see it all, but it's actually relatively easy if you think of it chronologically. On the left, we see the students who come to mind, highly qualified, interested in STEM. They're um, willing to take on a challenge. And on the right, we see our graduates, hardworking, creative, collaborative, persistent, and resilient. We hear this all the time from our alumni and from our industry partners. In the middle there, there are nine boxes. And uh, without spending too much time on them, these speak to what we're calling the signature student experience, the distinctive, unique experience to minds that um, at the end of the day culminates in a awesome graduate. And those range from in-person, uh, in-class, excellent education, to um, what you might think of as co-curricular efforts that are credit bearing and academic in nature, uh, but above and beyond just the standard curriculum, to purely experiential, like the m -Klein, these amazing traditions that build affinity for the institution. So that's a very quick uh, overview of kind of the Minds at 150 and some of the charge that Tony and I are gonna speak to you about today. Tony? Great, thanks, Colin. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, and I, I appreciate that the remote format because it gives me the opportunity to maybe talk with and see names and faces that I wouldn't normally be able to see because we're not all in golden. So um, when I can find a silver lining uh, for the pandemic, I say thank you. So thank you um, because that allows uh, this bigger conversation today. Um, I, I have been a professor at Minds for 21 years. Much of my work, of course, happens in the classroom, but I, I think my passions and the way I have grown and grown up at Minds um, have been when I push beyond the boundaries of a traditional classroom. Um, and I think about co-curricular and extracurricular experiences and how that adds to a really robust um, story of, of what it means to be a MIND student and a MIND faculty member or a staff member. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the MIND's signature student experience today. Um, my, I have been teaching in honors for over a decade. Um, I started in the McBride Honors Program and when I started teaching in honors at Mines, that was our only honors program. And I'm gonna tell you about how university honors and scholars programs has grown up over the last many years um, and offering more signature student experiences for our students that are seeking out um, more ways to complement um, the traditional minds education. Um, and many of these students are intrinsically motivated to, to learn about new things, um, whether they're gonna earn a minor uh, or, or get involved in undergraduate research. So, um, so I'm gonna talk to you about our five programs that we have now. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna forecast the growth that uh, is gonna occur over the next uh, two to four years aligned with Minds at 150. Um, so currently we have five honors or scholars programs. Uh, and I, I work very closely with Colin and it's, it's a wonderful opportunity as he works with these scholars communities. Um, these programs offer the, the curricular and the co-curricular experience that often align really well to the communities that Colin works with. So um, in that way, it's a very happy partnership uh, where we can kind of scaffold these experiences um, more broadly and offer um, that signature experience that uh, students are seeking um, to a greater number of students. So we have our Thorsten first year 
Honors Experience. Um, and this is a year long uh, program uh, and it covers some of the core curricular requirements in the first year. These students apply uh, to be in the program. We, uh, along with the, the year long core sequence, which I, I've, Paul Johnson has told me a few times that he needs a decoder ring for all of the acronyms I keep creating. Um, but the, the Thorson First Year Honors Program, that experience includes a year long course. And the course is called IDEAS. It's an acronym for Innovation and Discovery in Engineering Arts and Sciences. So it is a truly interdisciplinary, um, team-based, project-based uh, learning experience. Um, it's a collaborative interdisciplinary experience because the students are in the classroom with six to seven professors throughout the entire year. And these professors all come from different disciplinary backgrounds. Um, and I think students truly enjoy learning um, communication project based um, uh, opportunities uh, alongside a chemical engineer, a humanities professor, a mathematician, a geologist. So they, they can see when you get out there into the world, um, all the different lenses we use to um, iterate and approach problems and put it in a, in a human social context as well. Um, so we have the Thorson First Year Honors Program. We have the McBride Honors Program, which many of you probably know of. It's uh, one of the oldest honors programs in the United States. Um, McBride just celebrated its 40th anniversary um, just last year. And McBride program was created um, by President Guy T. McBride um, to give students um, a learning experience at the intersection of humanities, social sciences, and STEM. Um, and this is a 21 credit hour minor and has just a lot of wonderful co-curricular and extracurricular opportunities for our students. We also, in university honors and scholars programs, we have the Grand Challenge Scholars Program, which is um, affiliated with the National Academy of Engineering. Um, and they forecasted these, these grand challenges the world will face and students come into the program um, wanting to solve some wicked problems and again, engage in interdisciplinary curriculum as well as co-curricular opportunities. Uh, Teach It Minds is um, a teacher certification program. Um, we have just uh, been approved to offer it as a minor. Um, so while our students are here at Minds, they can have some early field experience uh, in a STEM classroom. Um, and they, they really serve as great ambassadors in K through 12 classrooms of what a Minds education can offer. And then we're sending these experts uh, to work with, with these kids um, and get them excited about STEM. So um, that's a, a program we're really excited about. Um, we have our undergraduate research scholars, um, which provides an authentic research experience for any MIND student who wants to apply. Um, and we, in addition, and I'll tell you more about this uh, towards the end of, of the talk today, um, we have two new first year honors pathways being developed um, and we're gonna be expanding opportunities in undergraduate research. So um, it's a pretty exciting time um, to be involved in these signature student experiences. Um, my role as executive director of honors and scholars affords me this great opportunity. And then when invited to serve as the assistant provost for our student signature experiences, um, allows me to even think more broadly beyond honors and scholars um, to help uh, other people around campus um, build out um, unique pathways that, 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 that students can choose from, because um, not one size doesn't fit all. Uh, I'm going to let Colin tell you a little bit more about his scholars communities, and then I'll come back and tell you how we're expanding the story of what it means to be an ore digger with some other opportunities coming up. Thanks, Tony. So now is the exciting part to, to dive into some of the new efforts that Tony and I are, are taking on. The first one I want to talk about um, 
is this emphasis on professional development. We're really hoping, or by way of some very intentional efforts, and in particular, a new foundation fund that's been created to instill or infuse a salient and common narrative of professional development across the board. <clears throat> um, that's an area where we can improve, where uh, we can stand by the professional development experience of all of our graduates and not just those who potentially um, sought them out or valued it. Because we know success uh, as a professional is more than what they're learning purely in the classroom. Think about how you have been as a professional. Yes, it is your ability to apply technical knowledge um, or expertise, but it is also so much more about how you handle yourself as a professional um, in and out of those meetings and in and out of those uh, assignments or projects. And we know that this is a differentiator as a young professional career. Uh, and that can make a huge difference in the trajectory of an entire career. And, uh, and so we are really seeking uh, by way of many different efforts to improve uh, this common experience related to professional development. And, um, Scott Hauser's on, on the call and, and I know Scott's up for next uh, lunch bunch, but he might even talk about some of the professional development emphasis coming out of economics and business, which is an absolute compliment uh, from the academic side to this effort broadly. What I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, for the next couple of slides is the, VA, uh, the VIP development program. This is the Vallejo Irvine program. Um, this was named after Fran Vallejo and Scott Irvine who generously gave $1 million to the institution to support intentional professional development programs. And these are a few of the competencies. In fact, what you're seeing here is, is a slide from a presentation we put together for uh, Fran and Scott. And these are some of the competencies that through an iterative process with them were identified as, as key areas of focus for their program. Communication, business acumen, career management and projection, some level of professional self-awareness and contextual awareness, active project management and professional relationships. These will be the focus of the VIP program over the next many years by way of a lot of efforts. And these are some of the efforts. Um, it'll be formally launched in the fall. We're kind of doing a soft launch because of COVID this spring. But in the fall, we'll uh, formally launch a suite of efforts directly attributed to the VIP program, including pre-internship workshops, lecture series, corporate advisory board that will um, consistently give feedback uh, to the program and to the institution, a career champions model, career center modules that will be done in the academic departments, development of uh, modules for administration to facilitate with students, uh, intentional collaboration with our diversity and inclusive and access um, efforts as an institution, spring break intensives, competency-based workshops, <laughs> What you're seeing here is a suite of efforts from that, which is a uh, high commitment, what you might think of, for example, with a spring break intensive boot camp, to a low commitment, but equally relevant when you think of maybe potentially just an hour or 90 minute workshop. But it'll be a consistent and frequent effort to um, engage with students in applied ways around professional development and to partner with faculty like Scott, uh, like Craig Bryce, um, who is the Friar Chair, um, with, with faculty who are in complement to this effort. And, and we can, by way of doing this, kind of create, again, that common experience in and out of the classroom that's really focused on professional development as a differentiator for our young professionals um, who will graduate soon. The other thing I want to speak to you about are these scholar communities. Minds has always been a strong community, and we've always had strong communities. I, I, one of the strongest communities, and, and I can say this and, and personally attest to it because I have taught in the program, is McBride. McBride is an incredible community. It's a community in the sense that students feel um, a level of support. They lean into the community. They are as much about the community's success as what is being fostered or developed for them. It is a complement to their uh, minds degree. 
not to steal Tony's uh, language, but Tony sometimes talks about mind plus. So with the mind's degree plus something, right? We've had great communities with fraternity and sorority life for years. One of our other strong communities is athletics. Those students benefit in athletics from uh, intense, meaningful community of support and what we often refer to as vertical and horizontal connection, where a student who's a first year student is meaningfully engaged with a junior and senior. And then when that first year student is a junior or senior, they are meaningfully engaged with a new first year student. So scholar or communities have been a, a marker of minds for a long time, but scholar communities are aiming to do more than just provide financial support because we've given out scholarships for a long time. But in addition to making minds financially accessible, we wanna say, here's some funds to support your education. And with that comes a community an experience, something developmental and educational out of the classroom. We really see this as a vehicle to achieve some of those signature student experience boxes that you saw on an earlier slide so that they go through those experiences together. Maybe they're climbing to the M in their community as an example. We want the students to lean into it so that they're actively engaged. Get away from students who say, yeah, I'm part of 17 clubs, but I only attend one meeting. We want them to lean in and be as much about the success of that community as what we are doing for that community. And we want those communities to leverage existing support. What we've seen by creating small communities within the big minds community is that those small communities can support students on a individual level better. They can see when students are struggling, they can connect them with the counseling resources, the academic support resources, whatever the resource might be more quickly and to a benefit. And so we are putting forward and, and heavily investing in uh, by way of, of my office and, and by way of engagement with, with uh, donors, institutional scholar communities and champion scholar communities with a focus on really complementing the educational experience that happens in the classroom. So uh, some institutional scholar communities that are are well known would include the Harvey Scholars, the Grucock Scholars, the Starzer Scholars is actually a new one we uh, just reformatted with Patty and Mike Starzer that'll start in the fall. And then we have others, what we call champion scholar communities like uh, Vanguard and Caldwell, uh, Paul Doors, uh, Hope's Enduring Flame. Uh, those are communities that are also important, but maybe uh, logistically managed outside of my area, but in complement to our area. So these are intentional efforts to create small communities within the broad minds community so that every student is meaningfully engaged in some kind of community and specific to scholar communities that they are given some financial assistance to make minds more accessible. This is absolutely in complement to what Tony's doing in her area and I'll transition to her now. Thanks, Colin. Um, I often think of the minds, the, the tradition of the M climb as a wonderful metaphor for the, the different communities that we get to be a part of um, and champion. And, you know, imagine a, a student's journey at minds is, you know, beginning to climb up towards that M. And we have curricular pathways that are, are pretty set, you know, you know, how to how to become a mechanical engineer, how to become an electrical engineer. But if we use that metaphor of, of the climb up the M, there are so many desire paths that students might want to um, cut across uh, in order to add uh, an additional experience to earning um, their degree. And, and I think of these scholar communities and these um, scholar opportunities and honors opportunities as ways for students to create those desire paths as, as they continue up that trail uh, to the M and to graduation and, and um, to becoming a, an engaged alum uh, and, and really to tell that story of what it was for them to be an ore digger. Um, I talked to you about the five curricular uh, components uh, or programs that are either an honors program or a scholars program in, in my unit. Um, and I think sometimes people will ask me, you know, what, ex what actually is an honors or a, or a scholars program? And it's more than a, a set of classes. I don't think of honors as um, in a disciplinary specific way in that it's, it's 
Calc 2 honor. So it's, it's a little bit harder, a little more rigorous and with a, a smaller group of students. Those, those kind of courses exist, but honors at Minds, whether we're talking about the Thorson program or the McBride program, it's, it's about curricular, co-curricular and extracurricular and the communities coming together um, to learn, but also to do things outside of the classroom together. Um, field trips, uh, guest speakers, um, other activities. Uh, we, we had a storytelling event um, where people came to and started sharing their experiences as, as alum. So when I think of our honors programs, um, it is that, that mix of, of learning across classroom environments, but also through um, living communities as well. Um, we, in addition to the programs I told you about, um, University Honors and Scholars also um, hosts the Office of National Scholarships and Fellowships. Um, and this is where we support students and alum uh, who are interested in applying uh, to these national and international opportunities such as um, a Fulbright or a Churchill Fellowships. Um, Goldwater, Marshall, um, there's, so there, there's opportunities there. And I'm gonna ask Ruth to make sure um, people on this call know about the University Honors and Scholars Program website, because this, maybe you're interested uh, in pursuing some of these opportunities yourselves. Um, Honors and Scholars Programs gives the opportunity to, to participate in Ethics Bowl, which is a national competition of uh, communication and um, prowess and understanding the complexity of, of big issues in our day. Um, the High Grade Literary Arts Journal is also housed now within University Honors and Scholars Programs, giving students an opportunity there. Um, we have over 800 students involved in honors and scholars programs. So we're getting close to about 20% of, of mine students having this opportunity. Um, I want to make it 50%. That's my goal. Um, that's a goal too that Paul Johnson has asked me to help the university achieve. And I think with partnership with Colin and, and other faculty and uh, staff here at Mines will be able to do that. Um, we are expanding an opportunity in our undergraduate research scholars program um, called FIRST, which is um, first year innovation research scholars training. And this is a, a picture of our, um, our cohort, our current cohort. Um, and these are first year students that are that apply for the this first opportunity um, to engage in authentic research the moment they arrive on campus. They're paired with a faculty mentor. They're not going into the lab and washing beakers. They're actually participating in the research and, um, uh, and being a viable member on a research team. Uh, we're launching a new first year honors experience, um, much like the Thorson program, uh, in that it's gonna be a year long uh, opportunity for students that will, um, and, and the year long course will, uh, give them some of their core curriculum credit. Um, and this uh, new program is going to be called the M Climb Leadership by Design. Um, so it will use the concepts from uh, the grand challenges, uh, looking at some of the, the wicked problems that the world faces, uh, and, and really helping students to think about different leadership theories that they might apply if they were leading a team um, moving through some of these projects. So uh, we wanted to underscore the importance of, of leadership through practice, but also in learning some of the, the key modalities. Um, and we'll, we're gonna have guest speakers come in and our students are gonna be able to shadow um, leaders in the field, whether uh, we connect them with a CEO or we connect them with an alumni uh, to talk about their career paths. But um, so this new uh, first year honors program will focus on leadership. Um, we also have another uh, experiment we're going to run uh, in fall 22 called the Discovery Pathway, where we want to integrate um, math, chemistry, and physics uh, into a team-based 
uh, hands-on experiential learning opportunity um, so students can contextualize some of these core uh, courses uh, and learning outcomes uh, into uh, real applied projects and team-based learning. Um, there's a lot of other things that are percolating up to the surface right now with student signature experiences, but those were the, the few new ones I wanted to tell you about so you can keep an eye out for the the new M climb leadership by design, because who knows, I might be reaching out saying, would you like to come and talk about your experience of, of leading teams throughout your career uh, to help our, our students uh, get a taste for that and to contextualize what they're learning um, in really important ways. Um, so I think it's so we can have time to chat with you and um, ask answer questions and uh, I'll, open it up to, to dialogue. How many students are in that Thurston Honors Program? We have 150 students um, and we typically get about 600 applications. Um, it has a carrying capacity because of the way we, we teach the course. Um, and so that's another reason why we're adding other first year honors pathways so they can still have that um, kind of smaller intimate learning environment uh, with, with a manageable cohort. And 150 seems like a, a good number. Um, we started with 75 students when we launched it and we're now at 150. Um, and the, the new pathway we're uh, launching will grow to about 150 um, and kept, uh, Paul likes to call them different flavors. So we wanna give students different flavors to, to choose from. Um, and so the, the new flavor with the M climb leadership by design will be uh, NAE grand challenge problems and leadership. And the Thorson program is that integrated integration of interdisciplinary learning. Um, but it's pretty impressive that over 600 students apply um, and we wanna give more students the opportunity to have an experience like that. So, and Tony, I have a question. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, is it feasible for a student to participate or be accepted in more than one of these programs? Or can they, do, 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 you know, I, I know you're bringing all the communities together and you're in the interlocking circles and, but how feasible is it for a first year student, for example, uh, to carry or be part of more than one of these? And can they? When they they do, they're not mutually exclusive. I would say that the, the new uh, M Climb Leadership by Design, you wouldn't be able to do the ideas class in Thorson along with that class because they, they cover the, the same core curriculum uh, classes. Um, but many of, I'll use Thorson as an example since Rod asked me about Thorson. Um, Many of those students also get involved in the first year of undergraduate research. Um, and then many of those students apply at the end of their first year to be in the McBride Honors Program, or they, they get involved in the Grand Challenge Scholars Program. Um, so they apply for the different fellowships. Um, so a lot of them can, you know, I go back to that metaphor of the desire paths as you're making your way up the M, mm -hmm. you know, they, they choose many of, of these desire paths. And I will say a lot of these students come in as Harvey scholars, Grucock, Daniels, Betcher. Um, and, and so they find a, a curricular pathway with, with some of these programs that I think complement much of the ethos of their scholarship communities or scholar communities. Um, so other than the first year honors programs, um, there's a lot of, of crossing over and, and students that, we had a student that just graduated um, who pretty much did them all. He was a Thorson student. He went into McBride. Uh, he did a Mines undergraduate research fellowship and earned the distinction of an undergraduate research scholar. Um, he was really interested in what it would be like if he ever wanted to teach STEM so he, 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 he took some of these Teach at Minds courses um, and uh, was also involved in Grand Challenges. An overachiever, but 
a wonderful human being <laughs> and he took advantage of all of them. One, one exception, um, and it is by design meant to be in compliment as Tony articulated. We've, we have begun to put some restrictions related to scholar communities uh, so that one student isn't part of multiple scholar communities, uh, thereby potentially um, receiving multiple scholarships. Um, we're trying to be thoughtful about two things. One, how do we impact the greatest amount with the funds that are available for scholarships? And also a lot of our scholar communities are, are significant commitment. Um, for example, if you were both in, in Harvey and in Grucock, you would have two events almost weekly and, and not be able to be a student. I mean, it's just a little too much. So um, we've been in, made some good decisions, I think, that are best broadly with restrictions around which scholar communities they can be part of and which ones they cannot. But the students always have that choice, just so you know. So if they are accepted to multiple scholar communities, we counsel them through that and they always have the choice of saying, this is the scholar community that best aligns with me because of the focus of the community, et cetera. And then if they chose to be a part of, I think it gets a little confusing because I, I also refer to Grand Challenge scholars and I refer to undergraduate research scholars. Um, these are the, the curricular pathways that the students in Collins scholars communities could choose. Um, and it is credit bearing. Um, and, and so they, they have those opportunities. And uh, at this point, we don't restrict that on our end. I don't mean to put her on the spot, but Madison, um, I know you've joined us today. You are a recent alumna who has who had participated uh, in the honors program. I just wondered if you might want to reflect or add your two cents worth about your experience. Yeah, um, so I was in the first cohort of um, the Thorson honors program. Um, and then from there, I went on to be join McBride. And then um, I was also the student ambassador for the University Honors and Scholars Program, um, kind of the first person in that role, um, kind of trying to mix these, some of these um, scholarships to, so people can intermingle too. Um, but Overall, I think um, those two programs really made my experience at Mines. Um, when I kind of look back, um, not that it was all that long ago, but uh, <laughs> it Mines and Thorson, like those are some of the most memorable moments I've had. Um, that being said, I also like can remember some other things from my like technical classes that were like really big and informing um, kind of who I am, but it was really the growth that I experienced through um, Thorson and McBride um, that I really attribute my success at Mines and then even my success afterwards. That's awesome. Thank you. I swear I didn't pay Madison to say that. <laughs> But at the beginning of the call, when I, when I was saying hi to her and, and telling her how much I missed her, she has made and continues to make an impact on the program. And when I met Madison's father one afternoon, he's like, you know, one day she's going to have your job. And I'm like, I hope so. <laughs> and one day uh, Madison will, she'll probably be leading the McBride program. So <laughs> has Madison shared what she just said with Don Thorson? I'm not sure if she has. Madison, um, did you get to meet Don when, uh, when he came out to chat with part of the cohort? I do not think I did. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think I was available. I think I might've had a class or some other commitment because I was decently involved throughout campus too, so. He would truly enjoy hearing that, I guarantee you. Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely look into reaching out and kind of conveying um, that to him. Madison, I'll reach out to you. We, uh, the students uh, write to Don pretty frequently. Um, and maybe now that we, we have two graduating classes through the program, um, reaching out to, 
to people like you to talk about post-graduation, what that experience was like. So that's that's a great idea, Rod. Um, I'll happily get you in touch with Don, and I think he would enjoy very much hearing from you. Perfect. I would appreciate that. Oh, uh, Tony or Colin, and what is uh, what are the challenges or what's the limiting factors in trying to grow the scholars program to reach other students? Is it faculty? Is it funding? Is it what what is the challenge in trying to grow that experience? It's, a, it's such a great question. Thanks, Andy, for putting that out there. You know, I think there, I don't want to speak on behalf of Tony. And so Tony, feel free to um, uh, validate what I'm saying or, or, or argue differently, but there's a real appetite from the students for these kind of experiences, community and engaging experiences, whether they're in the classroom through honors or out of the classroom through scholar. Um, I think they see the relevance of it. I think they um, value the development personally of it. I think um, there's an appetite. So I, th I think the students are ready for it. I think it's a distinctive thing that will help benefit the institution. And so I think faculty want to be engaged in it in meaningful ways. I, I know that Tony has a um, strong faculty base who are, are strong believers in what honors are doing for the institution. Um, and, and we always get faculty and alumni um, who are interested in working with students in meaningful ways outside the classrooms related to professional development, leadership, service, et cetera. I think one of the big things, and it often is the big thing for, for my area in particular with, with scholarships um, is funding. We need more scholarships. We do. Um, the institution um, you know, has to have some skin in the game. And, and I think we do in large part, we give out significant scholarships and aid to make minds accessible but the cost of education is only getting um, greater. And um, one of the neat things about the scholar communities, in my opinion, is that it is more than just um, tuition assistance. So not only is it $5,000 towards your tuition, but with it comes a, an experience, a program, a community, a meaning, a purpose. And I think that actually makes the 5,000 better. It, it's like a benefit on top of the dollar. The dollars are still there and we always need more of it. And I think um, being frank, foundation support, donor support of scholarships, it's not surprising. It's a leading um, uh, focus of the campaign because we need more of it. And uh, I, I'm acutely aware of that right now. Um, we had a tremendous number of students who completed scholarship applications for financial aid and scholar communities. The Grucock program alone, um, of which we will select 10 students, received over 800 applications. Um, today, we, we opened the, uh, the, this is my other job, this is the Dean of Students part of my job, we opened uh, the financial support that's accessible by way of the coronavirus response through the federal government. Um, and we opened it at 9 a.m. and we've received 900 individual requests for financial assistance from students in three hours. So we, we have this problem, cost of education is high. Um, right now, econ the economy is, is variable at best and concerning and a lot of families are hurting and um, we, we need more scholarship support. Tony? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, our honors and scholars programs actually don't come with scholarships. Um, we, I, I wish they did, um, but it's something that uh, I'd like to work on with, with Colin and, and others um, that there, there's, in my 21 years at Minds, I, I'm students that I've been working with in the last even five, seven years, there, there seems to be this greater intrinsic motivation to learn beyond what the traditional boundaries of a classroom. I wanna take what I'm learning and I wanna go do these things, whether it's a practicum or an internship. They're, they're also looking to, I don't just wanna take a, a series of classes um, and get to know people maybe because they're in the same major. I wanna be part of a community that is motivated in, in the ways that I'm motivated. 
motivated, um, the, you know, student who wants to um, think about the impact, think about, um, you know, what it means to be a, a leader, both in their field, but as a global citizen as well, um, and looking for opportunities to contextualize that. Um, and we can offer some honors enrichment opportunities um, for students to, to study abroad and do some of their internships or um, do some service learning. Uh, so their resources are limited, but human resources are also limited. I have to request from other department heads, uh, faculty members to come and teach in these programs in order to help deliver this curriculum and these co-curricular experiences. But then those departments are working with limited resources themselves. So um, as we expand these signature student experiences, um, I think the number one thing that we're gonna have to invest in is, is more faculty. Um, so departments are thriving and delivering their mission and their distinctive pathways for the university while we're able to offer these complementary signature experiences that further contextualize um, what it means to be a MINDS graduate. Um, and I would also say that the programs that I'm involved with um, and I'm trying to champion, it doesn't matter what major you are. And that's the other thing about this community that, so if you look at, for example, McBride, um, we have students across every single major involved in that program um, as they earn a 21 credit hour minor in um, public affairs, as well as the honors distinction. So more students want these opportunities and more students, they're also looking for flexibility with those opportunities. Um, and that's why we're trying to create um, more curricular flavors uh, for those desire paths for whether it be leadership or business acumen um, or putting things into a global context um, or policy or public affairs context. Um, so we wanna grow that, but we're growing it with limited resources across the board. And so Andrew, that's probably the biggest obstacle I face. May I ask a question regarding the programs? Hi, Tony Howard. Good to see both of you, Colin and Tony. Um, just listening to your resources question, is there a way to structure the, the generous gifts from these people, Thorson and all of them, so that these are not only scholarships, but they can somehow become self-funding of creating these um, faculty um, funding for the people that you need. It seems to me that you almost have to be a little bit careful here because you're funding a lot of scholarship and demand, but on the other side, there isn't the supply to take care of what we're promising. Um, so is it, I, I guess this is more of a foundation question than it is your programs, but as these people give these gifts, can some of those funds be channeled into hiring the appropriate faculty to actually do the program and not just recruiting students? And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, um, Stu, that's such a great question. Uh, and I think it is a foundation question. And I also, sometimes Tony and I talk and sometimes it feels a little chicken and egg. Do we go out there with this idea and then go look for the funding and support or do we wait? But I know, I know the thing that we both share, whether I'm looking for scholar dollars to support students and Tony's looking for resource dollars to support her programs, they're both needed. And, and the thing that's gonna make that possible is showing success. Tony has over years and, and in so many ways, we, we have um, by luck with, for example, the Harvey program, which is a, just a, a unique and, and truly incredible scholarship program. But we've got to show more success and then we've got to do things like this and bring awareness with our alumni, especially I think to our young alumni who can still give in meaningful ways to the benefit of a lot of these needs. I, I think that's absolutely critical. And then hopefully by creating the pathway, there's other engagement. I will say uh, it's very encouraging that the, the million dollar gift that was given uh, by Fran and Scott Vallejo for the professional development program has already garnered a lot of other interest from other uh, alumni who are 
who are contributing, uh, though in smaller ways, still meaningful ways. And so I think hopefully by creating these programs and showing success, we engage with donors. For example, I know I want alumni to come in and, and benefit the VIP program and speak to our students about professional development. Hopefully there's a bit of a reciprocal relationship. We're engaging them to the benefit of giving and to the benefit of our students having that exposure with alum as well. This probably gets into the mechanism of the politics or the bureaucracy of the school a little bit. Is there a mechanism whereby you two can actually work directly with the foundation so that some of the funding activities can be directed as opposed to, um, and instead of, how do I put this? Instead of donor directed, they, they can become guided by the foundation. So this is where we would like to see funds appropriated. I mean, I realize that big donors usually have a, an agenda that they wanna do, but do you, do you have an, an avenue or a mechanism where you can do that? Tony, you wanna talk about that? Um, sure, so Stu, I'll tell you that um, most of the, the gifts that we've received from, uh, let's look, Don Thorson, for example, it goes to the curricular development. It goes to paying for the faculty to teach and develop the courses. Um, and then we all work together as a team to come up with the co-curricular and extracurricular, the events and, and things like that. So the majority of our funds do go towards developing um, faculty and, and courses. Um, and we we do work directly with the with the foundation um, with the donors that have supported these these programs, um, and they often come with um, very specific requests from the donor of of how they'd like to see the money used. Yes. Um, uh, McBride has a lot more flexibility because we, being actually in its forty first and a half year, um, there have been other sustaining uh, funds um, that people have given to you. So we have a, um, a specific fund for a public affairs enrichment. So if a student has the opportunity to, to work in state legislature or go to Washington DC, we can use those funds for that. So there's flexibility with that. And um, the people I get to work with in the foundation have been excellent in, in helping to to think of new ways to scaffold those opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and again, to create more flavors because not every student wants to go and do an internship at the UN through McBride, but some of them do. Um, some of them would like to, to have other opportunities. So um, we do our best to kind of scaffold that and, and um, create the, the different ways to support students financially. Um, we've never had to say no to one of our McBride students. Um, but that program has also grown. Um, when I started teaching at McBride, there were 60 students in the program. McBride now is 150. Mm -hmm. um, so if all McBride students applied for an honors enrichment fund to do one of these exciting things, we'd go broke. A lot of them choose to do a practicum experience that is zero cost. It's just intellectually and creatively exciting. So. Um, there will have to be ways to grow out, to, to grow these opportunities if students um, pursue to, opportunities that do have a cost. To add on to that, I used to deal with Don Thorson when I worked in the foundation and he first started funding the senior design. I was the one that got him interested in McBride and then going that route. So that's how he got interested in that program. So I think back to what Stu's talking about, when you have a donor, you match his interest with a program and then these things happen. And Ron, that's what we're doing with this, the, the new first year honors program that will be launched in uh, fall uh, 21. Uh, we matched uh, donors interest, something this donor was really passionate about with a really exciting uh, curricular context with the grand challenges. So um, yeah, finding those matches and uh, pulling upon the things that our, our donors are excited about or passionate about and the ways they want to contribute because they want to see that impact for students. Um, and that's what McBride has been historically good at doing and developing um, more than one opportunity. Um, so 
So the way I'm understanding it, and I know we're uh, just a minute over time here, but just so I'm clear, because I'm curious and getting back to what Stu brought up, um, we have donors who say, hey, I'm really stoked about this idea and I want I want to give to it and maybe we can establish a program. And so then you do that. And then you have on the other side of the fence uh, staff who say, gee, we'd like to organize this. Is there a donor out there who might be interested? Like, does it kind of go both ways? You know, you've got donors who inquire and then you've got staff who are reaching out. In any case, you're trying to match, right? You're trying to connect those dots. Um, so I think you're right, Tony, what you were saying, chicken and the egg, you know, which comes first. At the end of the day, there's a program that comes out of it, but who initiates that initial or who initiates the conversation is, it, it can be both ways. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It goes both ways. And at the end of the day, the, the, the end point is a conversation where we where we construct something that's yeah. meaningful and support it, supports the donor intentions or passions and it will be impactful at the institutional level. We have ideas, lots of ideas. Tony knows that she's seen a proposal I've put forward for a scholar community that supports the ability for students to have a global education experience and travel experience. Tony's got a million and one ideas. She's got a file of things that you know can be pitched. And we need to show success so that we open the door with some credibility. Right. And we also need to think about how to, in my opinion, really engage the donors of all sizes. Yeah, it's amazing if, if somebody has five or 10 or $15 million, that's great, but most don't. And so how, how can we still have a meaningful engagement with donors on micro scholarships, for example, is one of the things I'm very interested in. $5,000 commitments over a two year period and so forth. That will engage and, and broaden the donor base even more so too, to a benefit beyond our programs to a benefit of the institutional level. We had a McBride alum who recently gave, um, it wasn't a, a huge gift, but it was because of uh, an opportunity uh, that he had in McBride. Um, when he was a student at Mines, um, he was a Taekwondo master. And one day he was coming into campus and he was riding the bus in from Denver and a, a blind boy got on the bus and sat next to him. By the time they got off the bus in Golden, he walked right into my office and he said, Tony, I know what I wanna do for my McBride practicum and I'd like to apply for a small enrichment fund. There's this school I can go to in the summer to learn um, how to translate Taekwondo into Braille. And I would like to teach children that cannot see how to do Taekwondo. And we said, yes, and we did it. And that was the learning experience that he wanted. Um, and he's a pretty successful um, engineer now. And he just gave uh, money specifically for, um, he said, I want to give an opportunity for a student to do something so far outside of their technical expertise. And that was what he said for how the money could be used. Um, that's cool. And, you know, and so often we have our alum who come back and say, I got to do this, this or that. And I want to give back in that way for another student to kind of push their own boundaries mm -hmm. and create their own. We, we call it the practicum, the make your own learning adventure. You know, what have you always wanted to learn that you haven't necessarily had the opportunity to do so? Um, often that leads in McBride to internships and um, fellowships. Uh, working at the UN or DC or traveling and studying abroad. But that one student experience who, who said, this is what I want to do. I want to write a braille manual for Taekwondo. So cool. Yeah. Um, everybody, it's um, a little bit after one. Um, I'd like to wrap up. And before I do so, uh, first of all, of course, Heartfelt thanks to, to Dr. Terry and to Tony. Awesome presentation today. So informative and wow, something that we all can uh, engage with and have an impact on. So thank you so much for taking time today. I don't know if um, Scott Hauser is still on the call. Doesn't look like it, uh, but a shout out to everybody. A reminder for next month, uh, March, Thursday, March 18th is our next Lunch Bunch, again, Thursday, March 18th. And we'll hear from Dr. Scott Hauser from
from our econ and business department who will share an update of all the exciting things going on there, including uh, the launch of the new undergraduate program in business and econ that's launching this fall. So you'll hear a lot more about that. Um, Bill, do you have any closing comments or anyone have anything, Andy, good for the order that you want to say before we say goodbye? Ruth, I just say again, I would second the thanks to Colin and, and Tony, very helpful. Um, we will also take a look, I think, at how can we get this out to a broader alumni base? Uh, your information has been very helpful and I'm sure there's an interest out there uh, that we want to tap into as well. So uh, appreciate that and appreciate the participation by everyone today. Good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your time. Take care. Hope to see you next month all. <laughs>